I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on holistic approach to flare flow measurement. I'm Randy Fenninger, Senior Product Manager for Flare Flow Metering. I'd like to introduce my colleagues that will be presenting today. Dan Johnson is the Lead Commercial Applications Engineer specializing in flare applications and will be presenting details about the regulatory environment that govern most flares. And Ben Berkey, the aftermarket sales leader for GE Oil and Gas. Ben will be presenting details around global service requirements as well as service available by GE to support GE flare meters. GE has a long history in flare flow measurements starting in 1980 with Exxon. A substantial portfolio of intellectual, intellectual property, including the patent that measures molecular weight from the sound speed of gas of a hydrocarbon gas mixture. This crucial patent set the stage for GE's substantial history in flare flow measurement that exists today. With over 5,000 meters installed around the globe, GE is the world leader in flare flow measurement and continues this innovative tradition today. All conventional flow technologies fall far short when measuring flare flow gases. All flow technologies except ultrasonic have problems with one or more of the requirements for proper flare gas flow measurement. Flare gases have highly variable flow rates and wide-ranging gas compositions. The measurement environment is often corrosive, wet, and dirty, and measurements are taken at or below atmospheric pressure over a wide range of temperatures. In this backdrop, a flare meter needs to operate at an unprecedented level of reliability since most flare gas is considered a pollutant and is subject to regulatory observation. Ultrasonic meters are the only technology able to endure the demanding measurement requirements in a flare. The reason why ultrasonic meters operate so well in such a difficult environment is that they have no moving parts that can foul or break, and since they measure flow using ultrasonics, they do not drift or require tuning, ever. The way an ultrasonic meter works is really quite simple. A sound pulse is set at a known angle with the direction of the flow. The velocity of the sound pulse is increased with increasing flow. The time it takes for the sound pulse to travel with the flow is called the transit time down, or T down. Next, a sound pulse is sent opposite the direction of the flow in the pipe. Since the sound pulse is traveling against the fluid flow, the sound pulse is slowed relative to the fluid flow. This is called transit time up, or T up. If there is no fluid flow present in the pipe, then T up is equal to T down, and the transit time up minus transit time down is equal to zero. However, when there is flow in the pipe, the transit times are different, and this difference, or delta T, is proportional to the fluid flow in the pipe. Without getting too deep into the math, since we're measuring delta T, the flow velocity is actually independent of the sound speed of the fluid. This is extremely important when making a flare flow measurement because the sound speed of the fluid in the pipe is changing due to changes in molecular weight, temperature, or pressure. An additional benefit of ultrasonic meter technology is the ability to measure fluid flow bidirectionally. A flare meter consists of electronics to process the signals, shown in the upper left-hand corner of the slide. Shown in the upper right, upper center of the slide are the transducers to create and receive the signals. Transducers are both receivers and transmitters in one. An insertion monitoring device, an isolation valve that allows the transducers to be removed and inspect, inspected without disrupting operations is shown to the right. The result is a complete flow meter system that is customized to each flare requirement. Ranging in size from 10 inches to 72 inches, flares have quite a range of installation requirements. Why measure flare at all? Okay, we know how, to, how a flare meter works and what makes up a flare meter, but why measure flare gas at all? As I mentioned earlier, flares exhaust waste gas to the atmosphere, atmosphere and for this reason, most governments require some form of measurement and reporting. Aside from regulations, however, a flare meter can aid in plant balance and yield control within a refinery or process plant. 
So if the GFA 68 meter can also measure molecular weight, it can help pinpoint process leaks quickly, acting as an inline in diagnostic tool to improve process reliability. In a flare gas recovery system, the GFA 68 meter can measure mass flow of the flare gas for further processing. The molecular weight feature on the GFA 68 can even aid in steam control for your flare by using the GE patented methodology for inert gas compensation. Okay, now over to Dan for review on regulations. Thank you for the introduction. As Randy said, my name is Dan Johnson. My position here at GE is a lead commercial application engineer specializing in flare applications. Petrochemical flares are one of the most regulated pieces of equipment in the refinery, and for good reason. A flare is essentially an emergency relief valve to be used when the plant is operating under conditions that are difficult to control. This includes startups, shutdowns, and emergency relief situations. Proper operation of the system can have a major impact on those within proximity to the flare and to the environment. These regulatory requirements vary by governing body and geographical location. However, the commonality with almost all regulatory requirements of a flare is the mandate of a reliable and accurate measurement. Defining the proper flare meter requires deep application knowledge, measurement expertise, and regulatory understanding. Flares, due to their very, due to their very nature, have a very wide application window, which presents many challenges. Designing the proper measurement system is key to an accurate, reliable, and most importantly, regulatory compliant measurement. As Randy just spoke about, there are many challenges to overcome when making a flare measurement. One such application I would like to reference is the designing of a flare meter in a refinery in California in a 42-inch header for compliance to local and federal regulatory requirements. Not only is this an application where the meter is being installed with less than ideal straight run, only 12 total diameters available, the process ranges from a molecular weight of 4 to 65 grams per mole. Through computational fluid dynamic analysis, which Randy will discuss further in the next section, and proper meter design, we were able to provide them with a flare meter capable of measuring across this wide range of gas composition that can achieve the accuracy requirements of the regulatory body governing this flare as seen in the accuracy table here. The specific regulatory requirements governing each flare are very critical in the design of the meter. One of the most recent regulations passed in the United States by the EPA is referred to NSPSJA, or New Source Performance Standard, subpart JA. This regulation went into effect in November of 2015. NSPSJA was written to control sulfur emissions in refineries in order to accurately determine the amount of sulfur being emitted. These refineries need to accurately measure the flare gas going through the line. They also needed to deploy a gas chromatograph and or sulfur analyzer. Per these regulations, flare meters were required to have a sensitivity of plus or minus 10 cubic feet per minute or 5% whichever is greater. This was later amended to plus or minus 20% for flow rates of 0.1 to 1 feet per second and 5% for flow rates of 1 foot per second and greater. Due to the way this legislation was written, it was very difficult for refineries to determine if the current metering technology installed is compliant with requirements. In order to evaluate current assets and determine if there are any potential meter upgrades required, many refineries turn to flare evaluations. During about a three-year period, GE performed hundreds of flare evaluations for refineries. For one refiner in particular, we performed an evaluation for every regulated flare in their network, a number totaling more than 60. Through these evaluations, we were able to determine which flare meters currently meet the regulations and which don't allowing them to box the problem and focus on compliance. Just as refineries had completed the updates required for NSVSJA, the EPA passed another regulation which takes effect in January of 2019. This is being referred to as the Refinery Sector Rule, specifically Section 63.670 in the Federal Register. What NSVSJA was to sulfur emissions, this regulation is to flare combustion efficiency. This regulation, however, is not just limited to new sources, it is limited 
encompasses all refinery flares in the United States. This rule was written in reaction to oversteaming of flares, which can allow for harmful toxins to be released into the atmosphere without being properly combusted. This regulation can be broken down into four parts, with one main goal of efficient combustion at the flare tip. The regulations require the refinery to maintain a net heating value of 270 BTUs per standard cubic feet in each 15-minute block average of operation. They must maintain smokeless operation with no periods of visible emission exceeding five minutes in any two-hour window and maintain a tip velocity of less than 400 feet per second at all times or as defined by the BTU content of the flare gas. And most importantly, they must automate and control all assist flows to the flare tip. This would include supplemental gas, steam, and air, if applicable. The economic impact of this regulation will be in the hundreds of millions of dollars to the United States refining industry. And this regulation poses many challenges beyond the measurement of flare and its assisted flows. Many refineries chose to install gas chromatographs during recent turnarounds associated with NSPSJA upgrades. These are used in the calculation of dry sulfur and also in determining the BTU value of the flare gas stream. Though the regulation was written in such a way that allows for the use of this technology, it would be difficult to control a system properly due to the measurement latency of a GC being 5 to 15 minutes on average. Many flaring events that occur during the refining process last for periods of less than this latency. In order to ensure proper system operation, other measurement techniques need to be used inside of this latency period. One such method would be the introduction of a calorimeter to the process. The response time of a calorimeter is typically less than two minutes and would allow for much tighter control of the system to maintain the net heating value required of 270 BTUs per standard cubic feet. However, the use of the calorimeter does not provide operators with any insight into speciation or molecular weight of the mixture inside this latency period. It also adds cost to meeting the regulatory requirements due to the installation and maintenance of the calorimeter. Maintaining the proper net heating value is only part of the battle. Operators must ensure that the combustion is smokeless, which, provides, which requires certain steam to flare gas ratios. This typically is driven by the makeup of flare gas. Additional steam is not required for gases of molecular weight 16, which is typically methane, and lower, hydrogen, but is required for hydrocarbons of C2 and greater. Another methodology for combating this controls nightmare is utilizing software that has been developed by GE. The software, called Flare IQ, utilizes patented algorithms with access to data from ultrasonic flow meters to address BTU measurement latency resulting from the gas chromatograph. This unique approach addresses the BTU measurement latency to ensure the flare operates at, at the efficiency expected by the EPA and it eliminates the need for additional equipment. Through this software package, the operator receives nearly real-time updates of BTU content, will receive the molecular weight of the hydrocarbon mixture, and the required set points for all assist flows. Though the focus of this topic has been regulations in the United States, regulatory bodies globally are looking at very similar laws for refineries in their regions. For example, the EU Commission Regulation 601-2012 is very similar to the accuracy requirements of NSPSJA. However, they utilize a tiered measurement structure with accuracies ranging from 5 to 17.5% depending on the location of the flare system. In Saudi Arabia, the government is currently looking at new regulatory requirements which require minimum flare combustion efficiency, which is very similar to the refinery sector rule we just discussed. Though these regulatory requirements have a negative capital Im impact in the petrochemical refining industry, they are generally written with the environment and well-being of the plant in mind, which truly makes this a global concern. Though regulatory requirements are often the focal point of flare gas measurement, there are other areas and advantages of flare measurement outside of regulatory purposes. I will now hand it back over to Randy to walk you through this. Okay, well, thank you, Dan. So let's talk a little bit about the benefits of flare measurement outside of regulations. When you can measure what you are speaking about 
and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot measure it and you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is, is of a weak, of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. Lord Thomas Kelvin. I like this quote by Lord Kelvin as it really expresses why we make flare measurements. We need to make measurements so that we can understand, and in so doing, we can take action. Regulations aside, without a flare measurement, we would be unable to improve processes and create a more efficient plant. Now let's look at an example. Okay, let's, if you're using a GF868 flare meter for improving plant efficiency, let's first consider a 42-inch flare. Let's say that that flare gas is roughly 80% methane, and on average is flaring at a rate of only 0.2 feet per second, which is a pretty low rate, and on a 42-inch flare would be barely noticeable. Over the course of just six months, this would mean a loss of nearly $65,000 at a market rate of $2.83 per million BTUs for methane. By tracking the flow rates and the molecular weight of the gas with the GF868 flare meter, you can quickly identify the process source leaks and reduce or capture the lost gas. This can be an important distinction in flares from being a source of lost profits to being a source of revenue generation. Okay. Accurate flow measurement requires a fully developed flow profile. Dan touched on this a little earlier. Traditionally, obtained by the requirement of having 20 D upstream or 20 diameters of piping upstream of the meter. Recognizing the challenges associated with limited straight run availability at many refineries, GE has embarked on a comprehensive multi-year study to quantify pipe bend effects on flow profiles under a wide range of conditions. By employing computational fluid dynamics, or CFD, required meter accuracy can be achieved without a fully developed flow profile. The addition of, of the required straight run to obtain meter accuracy is an expensive proposition in a refinery. It is also dangerous work given the nature of the installation environment. A non-conforming straight run that is uncorrected may add 5% or more of additional inaccuracy to a flare flow meter reading. If the upstream setup conditions is known and accounted for, meter accuracy can be obtained with as little as 8D upstream of the meter. A CFD correction will provide significantly better accuracy than an uncorrected meter in nearly all cases, regardless of the upstream straight run. Now I'd like to pass it over to Ben to discuss flare meter service requirements and options available to you. Well, thanks, Randy. As Randy mentioned, my name is Ben Berkey, and I serve as the aftermarket sales leader for GE Measurement and Sensing. Uh, first, I'd like to start with a big thanks to everyone on the line for your time and interest today. It's always a privilege to have the opportunity to speak, and I hope that you find this session informative. For my, for my portion, I plan to discuss the importance of proper flare servicing on any flare flow meter. As Randy and Dan have both highlighted, these meters play a critical role within a variety of industries, and because of that, ongoing service is going to be key to ensuring that you're receiving the best out of your product. As you evaluate any future meter purchases, I suggest that you not only consider product specifications, but also servicing capabilities. Flare flow meter OEMs are not only responsible for producing professional measurement devices, they must also provide quality technical support and the field service expertise necessary to prevent operational issues and quickly resolve any problems that may arise. I'd like to highlight a few best practices that are important for any service organization that works on flare applications. First, all field service representatives, whom I'll here on refer to as FSRs, should undergo extensive product training. Flare lines present a dangerous environment and require a high degree of specialization. Therefore, I feel that training is necessary to ensure that meters are both correctly installed and properly serviced. As a quick example, GE holds mandatory quarterly stand-downs for FSRs to provide technical updates and revisit safety precautions. This ensures that our technicians aren't getting careless as they become more and more comfortable with the job. Your provider of choice should also stay in frequent contact with the OEM product development teams. This helps 
to verify that FSRs are up to date on the latest technological advances and any new servicing methods. Lastly, spare parts replacement may be required in order to resolve any operational issues that may arise in the field. Therefore, it's important for technicians to maintain an inventory of spare parts. In GE, we refer to this inventory as trunk stock, which is made available for any on-site field visit. In the petrochemical space, new and increasing, increasingly stringent regulations continue to affect operators from product and service standpoints. In response, new technologies have been developed to address difficult low-flow accuracy requirements and a need for redundancy. Correspondingly, on the service side, organizations have also evolved to improve flare meter uptime. You'll see this in a variety of areas, and I'll provide a few examples. Industry-proven procedures are now used to account for regulatory verifications and validate flare flow meter operation. Diagnostic tests are performed on meter electronics to certify that OEM accuracy parameters are still intact. Flow simulations are run to ensure that meter performance meets requirements across a wide flow range. Now flow is as slow as 0.1 foot per second, and as fast as flaring conditions are accounted for. Lastly, hardware inspections are performed to validate structural integrity, account for any buildup on the transducer probe heads, and adjust for any process changes. All operators that fall under such requirements must employ the service capabilities to properly account for these demands. In my current role, I've visited over 60 refineries and petrochemical plants throughout North America. In almost all instances, I've noticed that operators are in need of OEM services to help account for regulatory requirements. In one instance, GE has partnered with a major international oil company to service all regulatory flares within its U.S.-based operations. Faced with the current regulatory pressures of NSPS subpart JA and the forthcoming requirements of the refinery sector rule, this particular customer sought to outsource its flare service liability. Now each of its regulatory flare meters are verified by an assigned GE FSR on an annual basis. The resulting regulatory verification reports are then housed in a secured online web portal that also tracks install-based information for all covered locations. The portal is a great source of information for the refinery environmental teams and helps to bolster site-specific flare management plans. As part of this contractual relationship, GE has also assigned a project manager to provide a single point of contact for all service inquiries, spare parts replacement, and any scheduling needs. The project manager monitors all upcoming flare meter verifications and schedules work proactively to ensure that services perform within the allotted compliance window. As Randy explained earlier, not all flare meter applications are deemed to be regulatory. Flare meters are frequently used on lateral lines to help identify the source of any flaring events that may occur. A good example of this comes from a GE customer that manages a refining operation in the western U.S. This particular customer uses GE flare meters for regulatory purposes on their main flare headers and for operational purposes on either, each of their lateral lines. From a service standpoint, this plan has entered into a contractual relationship with GE to provide regulatory verifications on the headers as well as preventative maintenance inspections on the laterals. As a result, the customer can track flaring events through the different areas of the plant. As I finish, I want to quickly highlight some ancillary services that may, that may be useful to your operation. The first is hot tap assistance. Ultrasonic flare meters can be purchased as a flow cell or they may be hot tapped to a live flare line. In cases where a hot tap is warranted, it's critically important that the nozzles are properly aligned on the pipe. Ultrasonic flow meters only allow for one degree of tolerance between two transducers, which requires all steps of the hot tap to be completed with precision and accuracy. Your OEM should have trained representatives to assist the hot tap and weld teams to, satis and weld teams to satisfy these difficult alignment requirements. The second topic of consideration is a flare meter engineering study. As the regulatory landscape continues to develop, customers are required to maintain compliance to the latest accuracy and operating requirements. In cases where meter performance is in question, your OEM should offer an engineering study to determine product accuracy across a variety of flow ranges and product conditions. This is becoming particularly important in light of the upcoming refinery sector rule. Lastly, it's beneficial for on-site customer personnel to have a basic working knowledge of how to operate and troubleshoot a flare flow meter. I suggest you consult with your OEM to verify whether customer training courses are offered because in many cases, a knowledgeable workforce can prevent the need for service callouts and help significantly improve your flare meter uptime. 
To summarize, service is not simply for break-fix coverage. Although timely response and technical expertise are necessary for unforeseen product issues, ongoing preventative maintenance is essential to get the best out of your flow, flare flow meter. Product capability is an important factor when considering future flare meter purchases, but service capability is an equally important consideration. So with that, I will pass it back to Randy for close. Oh, thanks, Ben, for that extensive services overview. Uh, in closing, I hope that we have provided everyone with a helpful overview and perspective on the uses, benefits, and changing regulatory landscape around flares and flare measurements. A flare flow measurement is a relatively expensive measurement to make. However, a properly installed and maintained flare meter is more than just required measurement. It can be an invaluable tool in improving plant efficiency and, process, and identifying process leaks. I hope that we have articulated the benefits that a properly installed and maintained flare meter can provide beyond regulation reporting. Again, I thank you uh, for your time and attention on this webinar. Ben, Dan, and I are happy to answer your questions now. So to submit a question, please use the chat window on your screen. Okay. Uh, questions? Uh, send your questions in, please. And. Um, Okay, looks like we got our first question here. Uh, okay, the question is, I have seen some people using thermal mass meters on flares. The technology is cheaper than ultrasonic meters. Why use an ultrasonic instead of a thermal mass meter? That's a great question. Um, one, of the, one of the problems with thermal mass meters is that they require a, that you know uh, the uh, gas composition because the gas composition is going to affect uh, is going to change the, the thermal characteristics of the meter and therefore make it uh, give it uh, substantial inaccuracy. So if you don't know the actual gas composition going through your flare or it's changing, uh, then the thermal mass meter uh, will be will have a high degree of inaccuracy. And this has actually been pointed out by the API in the upcoming ruling for uh, the uh, 1410 for flares. Additionally, thermal mass meters, since they are requiring a, 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 an element that is uh, uh, exposed to the, to the gas, tend to get uh, uh, dirty, they tend to get coated with materials, and this changes the thermal characteristics and added, added for additional inaccuracy, even if the composition is known. So thermal mass meters in general are not very good for mass, uh, not, not, not very good for measurement of flares. Okay? That's a great question, though. Thank you. Uh, next question looks like looks like Ben. This the question is for you. Uh, looks like uh, how does your service differ from other providers? Ben, why don't you take that? Thanks, Randy. It's a great question. Um, I, I think to answer that, it's important to note that GE and the legacy Panametrics business have been doing ultrasonics for decades. And you know, over the years, I feel that our service organization has come to distinguish itself by being a holistic service provider. So just take an example, let's say we have a customer that's listening to this webinar today and decides to go buy four flare meters, all of us on the line would high five. So on day one, we could send a field service engineer or representative to your site to go help you walk that flare line, um, collect the raw data that's necessary for our application engineering team um, to specify that meter for you. Um, so we're there at the start. Uh, when it comes time to install that meter, the same engineers and representatives are there to help you start up and commission that meter. And then moving in into the latter years, the same technicians are there to provide, you know, whether it's preventative maintenance inspections or regulatory verifications, we're there for that. And I think we're one of the few providers within the industry that can really claim, you know, start to finish services uh, with, with a holistic approach. Uh, the second thing, and, and I'll focus on this just from a U.S.-based standpoint because that's where I operate, we, we, we view service as a partnership. And if you've done business for any period of time, you'll know that we put equal importance on product development and the service experience that our customers receive. Um, in the U.S., we have 16 different field service engineers and representatives spread all throughout the states, which really helps us respond quickly in the event that you know, a, a critical event arises. Um, and we, we, we try to really cater to our customers in that respect. The other thing is that a lot of these technicians have been with the business for, you know, over 10 years um, when the business was then Panametrics. So there's a lot of technical expertise that comes with the GE service representative. All of our, all of our guys are trained up with the regulations, so if you have any questions with, 
NSPSJA compliance or questions about how you get ready for refinery sector rule, they're there to answer that. We always encourage you to look over their shoulders when they're providing a verification or a troubleshoot, and that way we can train you in the field. And I, I really think that kind of expertise is unparalleled within the industry, and, and we like to hang our hat on that. Okay, great. Thanks, Ben. Um, okay, I had another, another question came in here, and this one, uh, Dan, this one looks like it probably fits you the best. Uh, please elaborate on Flare IQ. Is there more information about this product? Uh, thanks, Randy. Um, so Flare IQ is a, a new product that uh, GE has launched this year uh, to help our customers with a, uh, a total solution approach to the refinery sector rule. Uh, Flare IQ is a software package that is a plug-in to the DCS. Um, it's not a controller, it's not a PLC, and it, it takes in all of the data that can be collected from uh, ultrasonic meters that are deployed on the flare line and all assist flows and provides the refinery with proper provisional set points of steam and fuel. Uh, Floor IQ also allows the refiner to have insight into BTU measurement through our patented algorithms. Um, for more information on this, uh, certainly contact your local sales representative for GE. Um, also on our website, you can find uh, brochures and data sheets for Flare IQ. Great. Thanks, Dan. Hey, uh, next question came. It looks like this one also fits you, Dan, so it looks like you're popular today. <laughs> uh, what, what exactly is done during a Flare evaluation, and what's the deliverable on that Flare evaluation? Okay, great. Good question. Um, so here at, uh, at GE, we have a, a couple of different um, types of flare evaluations, we'll call it. Through NSPSJA, um, because the, re the regulation was very focused on the meter um, sensitivity, during this regulation, we were able to evaluate the flow meters um, based on the process conditions at that refinery and provide them a statement of compliance or non-compliance. Um, this allowed the refineries to then come back to GE and uh, potentially upgrade their meters such that the sensitivity met the uh, requirements of the regulation. Now that we're on to the refinery sector rule, things have changed a little bit. Um, because the refinery sector rule is a much more complicated regulation, GE has two evaluations that we offer. One is just a, a simple evaluation of flow meter performance. Again, the regulations now specify accuracy, not sensitivity, so the requirements have changed a bit. Um, if the refineries had not upgraded their meter during the NSPSJA push, uh, there's a potential that they have some areas of noncompliance for the accuracy. Uh, this is something that GE can provide a report for based on their process conditions uh, that will determine the um, meter's compliance window. We also offer a full flare system evaluation where we look at not only the meters on the flare line and associated assist flows in terms of their accuracy and performance as related to the rule, we also look at the flare system performance, taking into account the process window uh, that the flare operates in and their steam and fuel capacity. This report is a very in-depth report and it allows the refinery to really um, progress down their path to compliance. Uh, again, for this regulation, GE is really focused on providing our customers a total solution. Okay, great. Thank you, Dan. That's a good, good overview. So the next question uh, looks like uh, it's kind of in my, my area here. So uh, the question is, I was told by our salesman that I need to upgrade my older bias 90 flare meter to a diagonal path flare meter to meet the RSR rule, and why is this change needed? So, um, well, without knowing the specifics around your application, um, it probably is required because you need to extend your path length uh, to increase the amount of resolution and therefore the accuracy of the meter. Uh, if you recall in the presentation, we talked about the delta T operation of the meter. Uh, when you increase the path length, you therefore uh, increase the delta T of the meter or the time differential of the meter. So at lower flows, you need a longer path length so you can extend that, that time differential. Without the ability to extend that time differential, you would probably not be able to meet uh, 
uh, the accuracy requirements at the low flow. And that's really, you know, the RSR rule uh, kind of targeted that lower flows between 0.1 and 1. If you remember Dan mentioned that's plus or minus 20%. Uh, so in order to get that kind of accuracy at low flows, you're going to need a, a longer path. So that's probably the requirement there without knowing specifics around your application. But in most cases, I will say, uh, you know, we've been doing this a long time, most BIOS 90 applications, if you have them and it is a regulatory flare, will almost certainly require an upgrade to RSR rule. If you're in the United States, uh, that's specific to the United States, but, uh, and I assume that's where this question uh, did come from, okay? All right, great. Uh, next question. I'm going to take this from the Ben. This one's going to go to you. Um, uh, looks like, what are your recommendations for regulatory verifications? Thanks, Randy, and I get this question a lot. Um, you know, with, with the increase in regulations on flare flow meter service, um, the OEM recommendation is important, and, and GE's specific OEM recommendation is annual verifications. Uh, we feel that in order for the customer to get optimal performance out of the flare meter, um, we need to check the electronics and the structural integrity of that meter once a year. And by and large, that's become the industry standard from what I've seen. Uh, I will note that there's certain areas, and granted I'm speaking to the U.S. again, but there's certain areas of the U.S. that may have regulations that are more stringent than our OEM recommendation. Uh, for instance, I know there's specific regions of, of California that mandate semi-annual verification. So in some cases, you may have to do it every six months, uh, so be sure to know what kind of local regulations you may be falling under. Um, I, I do want to note as well that uh, GE over the years has done a lot of work with offshore platforms, and in doing so, we developed a technique called in-situ verifications that will provide for any kind of customer that's under contract where we have an established service relationship and historical data on the meters to where we can uh, provide these verifications every other year without having to pull the transducers in the meter. Um, and what that does is prevent the need to put up scaffolding to get up to a flare meter installation. Uh, it prevents the need to bring out additional personnel or any uh, fresh air that's necessary in that, uh, in that process. So it can lead to uh, operational savings for the customer while still providing uh, the regulatory support required. So um, I guess to sum it up, Randy, it's, it's once a year per GE's OEM recommendation, but make sure to check your local regs. Oh, great. Okay. Thanks, Ben. So next question looks like uh, it's probably a direct more towards me, I guess, is uh, what is the percentage of liquid composition that the GF868 can handle without displaying an error? Okay, that's a that's an interesting question, and you know it's not a straightforward uh, answer that it's 22.6 percent. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, depending on, uh, typically depending on the variabilities in the flare, uh, you know if there is water vapor present, uh, the, the flare meter can handle very really high levels, 40, 50 percent. The problem arises when, you, when uh, if you get into these, the water vapor actually uh, turning into a liquid. Now, if the liquid is uh, uh, substantial enough that it starts to deposit on the, on the transducer heads, it can add to uh, a, a, a sound uh, uh, problems with the meter. In other words, you're going to get uh, your signal to noise ratio uh, will will be distorted slightly. Um, in general, though, we're comfortable with, with uh, liquid compositions in a flare meter up to 20% without any problems. We've, uh, we've gone higher than that in the applications depending on temperature, uh, if, it's, uh, if the liquid is, uh, is, in the, is in a vapor phase or not. So in general, 20% to 30% we, uh, we're comfortable with. Above that, we start to get a little bit concerned. We have a, an applications group here uh, that, uh, that, that reviews applications and determines whether the, the meter can can survive in those applications and, and, and work properly, and uh, then we go through that and determine that. So in general, 20 to 30 percent would be something we'd be comfortable with. Above that, we'd probably run it through our applications team and to determine whether that makes, uh, uh, makes sense in that application. But it's a great question. Okay. Another question just came in, and Dan, I think this one's good for you, is... Uh, do you offer products that help with the measurement of the assist flows that were mentioned in the refinery sector rule? 
Oh, that's a good question, Randy. Um, yeah, so, so GE is very unique in that we have uh, a very broad product portfolio when it comes to the Flare system. Um, really, the only measurement point that we are not providing today is uh, a means to measure heating value, um, which we actually are able to do through software. It's just not a regulated measurement. Um, so we offer a ultrasonic steam meter, which is uh, basically the sister product of our GF868, which many of you are probably familiar with. It, it's based on the same technology and transducer design as the GF868. Uh, it has built-in steam tables, and uh, it comes at a much lower cost. This is really important because with this new regulation, refineries are expected to measure these assist flows with the accuracy of 5%. Um, with current technology typically deployed uh, that we've seen, um, a lot of refineries are using orifice plate, which typically doesn't have the turndown ratio you need for a, um, a, the flare operation to maintain uh, smokeless operation at the tip. Um, again, uh, if you're interested in, in any of our products, want to learn more, um, you can contact me directly or uh, your local sales representative, and we'd be happy to further discuss. Great. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Hey, just want to remind everybody, you know, just uh, you can just you know put the button there, submit a question for us, and uh, we can go through and answer it. Uh, uh, I do have another good question here. I think um, I think Ben, this this is actually a really interesting question, and, and Ben, I think this one is probably best for you to answer. Is uh, you know the, the person said, hey, they've seen the, the, the Predix commercials and all the digital services, and they're wondering, uh, the, do we plan to provide any digital services in the future for our products? Great question, uh, Ben. What do you think? Yeah, th thanks, Randy. With all the uh, ads that GE's been playing on Monday Night Football, I figured we'd see this, but. Uh, the short answer is yes, absolutely. The uh, the parent company of our division has actually changed its name to Digital Solutions to really feed this thought process all the way down the food chain. So we are absolutely positioning ourselves uh, for more digital solutions in the future. We we now have a technical center of excellence in San Ramon, California, and um, you know I really think there's going to be big opportunities there in the future. Uh, Randy, as you said, really what we're trying to get to is Predix. Predix is an analytical platform that helps us provide predictive analytics for um, industrial equipment throughout whatever your application is. And um, we're working to um, get our, you know, our services and our equipment on that platform currently. I will say even right now, we do provide certain digital services to uh, a few midstream customers. Um, one particular customer has flow meters within their midstream lines and has placed digi converters on them. So our service team based out of Houston can actually remote into that meter, check the uh, diagnostics and the parameters of the meter from their laptop, and alter that if necessary. So we can go in there and make changes to that system um, if any issues were to arise. That's just the beginning, and I'm really excited about um, our future in digital. Excellent, Ben. Thanks. Yeah, that, that's that's a big thing going on, and uh, I think uh, uh, anybody has any good additional questions that they uh, you know please uh, go through. Uh, you can contact Ben there and and uh, get some more information because that is going to be that is the future for this industry. I can tell you. Okay, uh, looks like another question here came in, and this one I think probably should I'll handle this one. Looks like. Um, the question is that you mentioned the need for straight run before the ultrasonic meter. Why do I need straight run, and can you explain CFD in a little more detail? Okay, so straight run is required before the meter to essentially pr provide a flow profile that the meter can actually work within. So typically you get a very, very a fully developed flow profile in a gas meter when you have at least 20 D or 20 diameters of straight run uh, before the meter. And this, the straight run is actually, essentially what it does is it conditions the flow so that the flow profile becomes fully developed. When I say fully developed, when you have a flow that goes around a bend or a turn, you get substantial changes in flow. You get swirl. You get you get pockets of, of, of higher higher flow and lower flow. And this this will actually distort uh, almost all flow meters' uh, ability to actually correctly read the flow rate. Some meters, like mass meters, aren't affected, but 
uh, most most uh, flow meters are affected by this, so they require uh, a, a, a something you know a fully developed flow profile. Typically, in a flare, this is achieved with uh, with straight run. 20D of straight run is the industry standard, and as you can imagine, imagine on a on a on a fairly substantial flare of say 42 inches, that's a lot of straight run. 20D times 42, that's a 840. Uh, inches of straight run, so that can be expensive and, and sometimes even difficult or, or if not impossible to achieve in a refinery. So with that in mind, GE embarked on a uh, CFD or computational fluid dynamic uh, program, Must, I think it's going on like three years now, and four years even, and, and essentially what we've done is we've continued to catalog and understand and document the different changes in flow profiles and how they affect and how they are affected by, <coughs> excuse me, different uh, changes in, in the uh, upstream uh, uh, disturbances. With that in mind, we've been able to do, uh, you know, meet the accuracy requirements of these uh, of these rules with as little as 8D or 8 diameters of straight run. So you can imagine that same 42 inch flare only requiring 8 diameters of straight run rather than 20 diameters of straight run. That could be substantially uh, less expensive for a greenfield or in some cases maybe requirements for opportunities in, a, in, a, in an older refinery without having to uh, upgrade that. So uh, the CFD has been a substantial uh, performance enhancer and we've done it quite a bit. Okay, that looks like, excuse me, that looks like that's it for the questions. I don't see any more. Um, again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining uh, the, uh, the webinar. And if you have any questions, you can contact, all the contact information for myself, Ben and Dan is in the, uh, in the, in the uh, webinar. So please uh, send it along. Okay, thank you.